Hear the word of God. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. You know the message that, uh, that He sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging from him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they had heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they invited him to stay for several days. Isn't that a great story? Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would indeed open up our hearts and minds to hear your word and to uh, hide it in our hearts and to live it and respond to it with prayer. So we, we pray this in Jesus' name. First thing I notice in this passage is that when God is at work, expect the unexpected. When God is at work, expect the unexpected. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. And this meant that he was a military commander of about 600 men, equivalent to a modern-day battalion. He was known and respected throughout his community for being devout and God-fearing, and he gave generous, generously to those in need and prayed for God regularly. And then God responded to his faith and righteousness by telling Cornelius these words, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a remembrance before God. And it was also reported in verse 22 by those who were sent to invite Peter to come to Cornelius' house that he is a righteous man and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. Cornelius was expecting God to do something wonderful when Peter came to his home. So he prepared for the visit by inviting and, and gathering together all of his relatives and close friends. So while God was preparing Cornelius for the unexpected, he was also preparing Peter for the unexpected and a new understanding of God's love and grace for all of the nations. The experience with Cornelius was going to break down old worldviews and establish the new missional church that would go out to all people. When Peter arrived and entered into the home, the meaning of the vision became very clear to him. And he said these words, you are all aware that it, that, that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit them. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. So Peter came and he entered into a Gentile house. Some, you know, most self-respecting Jews would never do that. But God knew, but Peter knew that God was up to something new and different. And so he took the chance and he took the risk of faith that God was up to something great. What Peter discovered was the ground, is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There are no religious rules, ethnic heritage, or practice that one must possess to qualify for God's goodness, his saving favor, his grace, this gift that is given to us freely in Jesus Christ. Some today might think that because they have uh, lived good lives, have been met, they've met all religious qualifications, they've been born in a religious uh, country, a Christian country, that they qualify them 
And that qualifies them to be um, Christians or to be saved. But it is not what the scriptures say. What the scriptures say is, and the good news is, that religious or cultural conditions, uh, that there are none of these things that can be met that qualifies for God's salvation blessings other than believing in Jesus Christ as Lord. So Peter was sent to Cornelius to share this good news because God wants his people to participate in the harvest that he has for all people. Well, Peter's intuition was confirmed when he stepped into the house of Cornelius and heard the reasons for the invitation and saw the, this expectant crowd. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Now, this first statement of Peter to his Gentile audience brings a reality to a point of grace that we can all appreciate. God shows no partiality to anyone. He receives everyone, everywhere, from every background, race, any social class, every situation in life. It does not make any difference to God who you are or what you are, where you've been born. You're all loved and received into his family if you'll believe in his son. This meeting at Cornelius' house was the inauguration of the mission to all Gentiles, to all of us. Now my second point is that we should be prepared to share the gospel message, especially with people prepared to receive it. Peter saw faith in the eyes of Cornelius and his gathering, a people fully prepared to receive Jesus Christ. He witnessed to his Gentile audience what he had seen and heard from his own experience with the living Lord. Even after his resurrection, he ate and drank with him. Peter shared everything important to know about salvation. He didn't start by telling them that they had to meet some Hebrew standards of religion before they could come to become Christians. It was a clear message calling them to believe in Jesus Christ's life, his death and resurrection, and forgiveness of sin, and, the, and then having a heart for God that prepared these people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, which the angel had proclaimed, they all received what Peter gave them. You see, it was Peter's job, and it's our job, to take the message of Christ to those whom God has prepared to receive it, to be sensitive to and to recognize when somebody is eager to receive that message, and then to have a message to give to, the, give to them. Now, communication studies show us that audiences uh, who come prepared to receive the message are the ones who get the most out of the message. When you come to church, for instance, come with a prepared heart. Spend some time being in God's presence, praying and reading the Bible. Contrary to popular opinion, preaching is not a spectator sport. Too many people see preaching as a one-way communication and that its success or failure rests solely upon the preacher. That's not the case at all. We're our, my responsibility as a preacher is to prepare a message that I feel God wants everyone to hear. Your responsibility is to come expecting to hear something from God that will touch your heart and mind. And that you pray for me and you pray for your preachers to, to be inspired and to give a message that will speak to the needs of the people. So prepare your heart to be receptive by getting, getting enough sleep. <laughs> How many of you stayed up to pass 11 last <laughs> Get enough sleep and pray for inspiration. Don't get bogged down with delivery styles or mistakes that are made. Pay attention and stay focused on the point while not being distracted. Don't worry when the PowerPoint doesn't work right. And, uh, you know, don't be distracted by that. Sometimes those things happen. Focus on the Word. Have the Bible open before you so you can refer back to hearing God's message and underline what you have heard. Take notes. We provide in the, in the grapevine an uh, open space in that for you to take some notes so that you can take home some of the message with you and meditate upon it. Pay attention. Stay focused. Most importantly, come with the expectation that God has a special word for you. After all, you're in the very presence of God, but two or more gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'm there in the midst of them. Come knowing that God has a special message for you to respond to and to give glory back to his name. 
So my third point is that when God has prepared receptive people and when the gospel has been received, the Holy Spirit will do the rest. While Peter was still preaching, he was interrupted by the Holy Spirit, preempted, so to speak. As he's preaching along, suddenly the Holy Spirit falls upon the people. He didn't even have an opportunity to have an altar call to bring people forward to receive Christ. The Holy Spirit just fell on the people and they started to speak in tongues and praise God. Now Peter and his companions were amazed at this. They had seen this once before, maybe several times before. They had seen it, first of all, at Pentecost, where they received the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues and were inspired and excited to share the good news with the people around them. Here now they were seeing it again among the Gentiles. What a great moment to be witness of. It was the very same experience that they'd had in the upper room. And it was the same powerful working of the Holy Spirit who helps unbelievers become believers. I don't think Peter or any of his Jewish companions expected anything like what they witnessed on that day. They may have thought that they were there to direct these God-fearing Gentiles to the church membership class, where they were, where they and they, they were there to direct these God-fearing Gentiles into, um, you know, a, a class about circumcision, becoming a, a good Jew, and then perhaps receiving Jesus after that. But in reality, God wanted them to be open and willing conduits through which He could pour out His Holy Spirit to the first group of Gentiles. It was a sovereign work of God here, and so Peter made the executive order to have them baptized just as, uh, just as others had been. What a great moment. You know, in our age of religious pluralism, when well-meaning Christians want to see the good in all religions, Peter teaches us that while the gospel is for all people, all people must come to worship the one true God in Jesus Christ. These events set in motion a chain of events and conversions down through the generations, right to our generation, so that all could believe in Jesus. So do you think that God could use you in some way, some unexpected way, to preach the gospel into the lives of others that you would never expect and would receive? I'd like to share with you a story about a little-known person and how God changed the world through him. Back in the mid-19th century, the 1800s, uh, there was a man named Edward Kimball, and he was a Sunday school teacher of a little class of teenagers in a little church in Chicago. One Sunday, a new kid came into his classroom, and, um, and Kimball recognized and uh, observed that he knew nothing about the Bible, knew nothing about Christianity, and especially didn't know what the church was all about. But he was there, and Kimball made a note of it to go and see him the next week. He found out where the young man worked, worked in the shoe store, and so he went to that shoe store and looked in the window, and sure enough, he saw the young man in there, and he was, Kimball was a little um, nervous about going in and sharing the gospel with him, but he overcame his, uh, uh, his uh, lack of confidence and went into the store with a little bit of courage to share the gospel. As he shared the gospel, this kid actually received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And um, I want to just say, chances are high that a good portion of us here have been affected by that one conversion to Christ, by Edward Kimball taking time out of his day to go and find this young lad and to share with him the gospel of Jesus. You see, that kid who gave his life over to Jesus Christ was none other than um, Dwight L. Moody, who became one of the greatest evangelists of all time. And he witnessed hundreds of thousands of people who received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. One of the people that came to Christ under Dwight Moody's ministry was a man named Wilbur Chapman. He too became an evangelist and preached to thousands. And under his ministry, a baseball player named Billy Sunday received Christ as his Savior, and he too became an evangelist and led thousands to Christ. And under Billy Sunday's ministry was a man named Mordecai Ham who came to Christ and became an evangelist. And under Billy, or Mordecai Ham's ministry, a young man, a high school 
student in North Carolina named Billy Graham came to Christ. And he's led millions to know Jesus. Some of us have received Christ under his ministry as well. What all, Edward Kimball was a man few people could have could name today who have ever heard of him. And he wasn't really anyone in anybody's eyes that would amount to much, but he led one person to Christ. And look at the chain of events, because he took the time to share Jesus with one man. In summary, I have a few challenges. With all the challenges in ministry today, and, we, and the church faces many of them, God has planned that God has a plan that, that may seem like installing a bolt in a different way than what was commonly known or as, as the correct way. As your new pastor arrives a few, in a few months, expect the unexpected. God has a new plan for Geneva to reach people for Jesus. Don't let personal agendas or traditions stand in the way of what God wants to accomplish through faithful people who take the risk of doing something new. Be prepared and ready to share with others the love and grace of God in Christ, expecting people to respond to it. Be like Cornelius was, who invited people to come and hear the good news. Invite people to come into this place to hear Jesus proclaimed and the good news of salvation. And lastly, there may be those of you here today whom the Holy Spirit has caused you to be here to hear the gospel message for the very first time. That God loves you, cares deeply for you, wants to transform your life and set you free. He wants to give you a new life, a new heart in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is knocking on your door and He's saying, let me in. And all you have to do is open that door and say, yes. Can you say yes to God today? Yes to his transforming power presented by his Holy Spirit. Do you feel the Spirit moving among us, blowing like the wind across our hearts and minds today? I do. Today is the day of salvation. Don't miss it. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for the message of, of your good news. Thank you for this message about Cornelius and Peter and how you had been working behind the scenes to bring them together so that the gospel could be made known to God-fearing people, people that sought you out, people that were prepared to hear your word, and people that were prepared to give it. Thank you, God, for this message that you've called the church today to do just that. And that for those of us, Lord, who are sitting here hearing the message for the first time that Jesus loves them and wants to give them forgiveness of sins, Lord, I pray that you would help them to receive you today. And I pray, God, for all of us who know you and, and honor you and serve you, that we would be ready and willing to share the love of God with others, not only in word, but in deed. And so, Lord, we turn over the rest of this day and this week into your hands, asking for divine appointments, that your spirit would guide us, that you would send even angels and visions to guide us to those whom you'd like us to speak with. And we pray it in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen.